All right, welcome to tonight's webinar or meeting. Uh, and this is a meeting of Linux citizens for safe tower siting, safe cell tower siting. My name is Jonathan Mir and I'm sort of guest hosting. I actually am the co-founder of a group about an hour east of Linux called Hilltown Health. And I've come to know Courtney Gillardi and her family over the last few years. And she asked me if I could come out and host tonight and I'm very excited to do so. And um, I know most of the panelists and have learned a lot from them. So if you're sort of new to this issue, you're about to get a lot of um, expert input on your uh, cell tower decisions there in Lenox. So without further ado, um, I wanna introduce our first panelist, Scott McCullough, attorney Scott McCullough. Scott has 38 years of experience, including litigating and winning the FCC guidelines case, which I'm sure we'll dive into a little bit tonight. Attorney McCullough's focus of practice is public law, including consumer rights, procurement, telecommunications, administrative law, consulting, governmental relations, and instruction and training in those areas for individuals, groups, and companies, and government agencies. Uh, Attorney McCullough served as a faculty member at the Center for Lifelong Engineering Education in, from 1987 to 2002. He instructed telecommunications management and re regulation course, uh, a telecommunications management and regulation course for government and private industry voice and data network managers. Attorney McCullough was also the Chief Public Agency Representation Section Assistant Texas Attorney General for 10 years. He represented the state of Texas before our regulatory agencies with jurisdiction over gas, telephone, water, and electric utilities. Um, and he's here this evening to tell us what can be considered in the Lennox wireless zoning bylaw and why our hands are not tied. Um, that's sort of a little reference to uh, something we run into a lot in sort of the towns around my world where there's often a, a perception uh, because of the 1996 Telecommunications Act that our hands are tied and there's nothing we can do uh, in terms of maybe taking a more proactive or protective approach to cell tower siting. So Scott McCullough, very nice to see you this evening and thanks for- Yeah, this may be showing here. up backwards on y'all's screen, but what it says oh, yeah. is <laughs> only one finger tied. I got that from a friend. Um, and I much appreciate it because, yeah, it's true. Um, y'all, y'all probably hear from the telecoms and many of your city leaders that, you know, I'm sorry, the FCC made us do this horrible thing. Our hands are tied. Well, it's not true. You may have one finger tied, but you got nine fingers left. And I'll get into that for a second. But first, um, I want to say, you know. I'm a lawyer, and thankfully, I've yet to be negatively impacted by RF, EMF. I'm always uh, humbled and honored to be able to be on the uh, things like this with the subject matter experts who really know what they're talking about. Folks like Kent and Theodora and others who really deep dive into the details. I'm just the one who gathers it up, and presents it, tries to make it make sense to a judge. Some. And so, you know, don't, don't elevate the law over human beings and real subject matter experts. <clears throat> I did find a few minutes to compare the existing bylaw provisions in Linux, chapter six, um, section 10.3, and then I looked at the newest draft that's come out. I didn't have a lot of time, but I, you know, I spent maybe five or 10 minutes on each. What I wanted to do was to see what might be missing in the current bylaw that might be fixing, and then maybe get an objective take on the goals that are sought to be obtained by these proposed revisions. Um, you know, I, I gotta tell you, I've seen worse or ordinances than what you have in place now in Linux. They're not the best, but they're not bad. So I have a hard time really understanding what, what the need for change is. And, and understand the ones that are under consideration now do not have anything to do with small cells and right-of-way. These are wireless facilities, not in right-of-way. 
a fairly limited but also very important uh, thing. For the most part, what we're seeing out there now is small cells in right away. Towers are still important. They're hugely important. And how they are placed, where they are placed, and when they are placed are also hugely So, yes, it is good to have a good ordinance. I don't know what's wrong with the current one, but I can tell you after comparing to two, it's pretty clear what was intended here. And it was to make it easier to put more facilities in more places to the point that even when there's significant opposition to any one proposed site, the project will probably still be approved. It's clear. They just wanted to make it easier to put this stuff in. Now, if that's what Linux wants, okay. But I was stricken by a few other things. First of all, the draft is not well written. There's typos in there and misspelling. It's still not complete. For example, the terms on administrative approval in 8, 18, 8.3 are just not there. There are none. It says to be, to be supplied. There's at least one internal inconsistency. Proposed 8, 18, 10B exempts eligible facilities from several items in 8, 18, 18 10A, including 8, 18, A6, even though 818A6 has a specific entry for eligible facilities. So it's just an inconsistency. Um, what else is wrong? Again, I only had about 10 minutes, but here's a partial list. It doesn't provide for notice to residents for anything other than a new tower. It doesn't consider or address environmental or historical resource issues. By the way, the current bylaws do, at least to some extent. So they're just taking that out. The application yep, yep. content requirements, the things that are required to be in any application. I'm getting some feedback. Okay. They ask for far fewer things than the Yeah. I'm done. I'm driving now. Then do the current bylaw. Yeah. And again, I think that's probably intentional. Uh, the content requirement section is one, of, is one of the most important parts of any application, and they need to be laid out in any ordinance with specificity. It's important to have a solid list of the important things that are necessary to make the ultimate decision on the criteria, the substantive criteria that are set out in the ordinance. And as a practical matter, it is one of the best shot clock management tools there is. If you have an exhaustive list, everything you know you, the staff will need to evaluate it, then they will be able to check through it, make sure it's all there, and, and, and they will be able to then look at it, make whatever discretionary determinations there are. Further, if there's anything missing from the required application content requirements and staff catches it within 10 days, they give notice and it stops the shot clock. So it's hugely important to be very specific and, quite frankly, have a lot of things. Everything you think you will need in the application content requirements. It must be robust. There are also especially important application content necessaries. I'm going to give two examples only. I'm going to go by the rule of two tonight. I'm going to give you two examples for everything going forward. First, it's important in every uh, application that there be an absolute sealed engineer um, proof of electrical fire and safety building code compliance and proof of structural integrity uh, consistent with the correct national standard. None of that is in here. Yes, it is true that the draft ordinance does require building code, electrical code, fire code compliance, but it doesn't require that the application prove it. What you need to have in your in your ordinance is for there to be a sealed engineer promise that that engineer designed this project and certifies that it will, once constructed, meet all applicable code compliance. Then the staff can rely on that seal, and they can go, okay, we we know you know they've designed it safely. Finally, then at the back end, once the thing is designed, they have the diagram, they know what it's supposed to look at, 
once it constructed and they do the building inspection, they can look to make sure that it is there. This is how you avoid the significant fire risks that these cell facilities place. Now, I'm not going to talk about fire here tonight. We've got someone in the audience who could for a very long time, and it'd be a great topic for a further thing. But let me just tell you, these things are fires waiting to go off, especially if they are not designed properly. When we've gone in and looked at some of them, we find that simple things like fusing is just wrong. They're overfused. They've got way too much fuse capacity for the demand that's going to be put on it. And if something happens inside the system, you will get an arc in there for a fire. The FCC has not preempted local safety codes. They have expressly said that part of this process, the local jurisdiction can ensure safety code compliance. Yet there's nothing in here other than a bare statement. It's got to comply with code. Well, how are you going to prove that? How are you going to verify? Similarly, structural integrity. If we're talking about towers on private property, there are national standards for this. There's actually two sets, one set that's low and one set that's high. The one that's high applies to national security telecommunication facilities, and it applies to any facility that's going to support 911. Now, again, uh, this says that um, the supposed to comply with things. It does not mention structural integrity standards. It says code. So we don't know what the structural integrity requirement is going to be for any of these towers. If you get a big wind, uh, if you get some other kind of storm there, you want to make sure that structure will withstand it. You want to make sure that it was designed to carry the load that will be put on. And there's nothing in this ordinance that requires that the application prove that indeed the design will have structural integrity. The draft completely lacks mandatory conditions for every permit. I, I've looked at a thousand ordinances and bylaws and almost every single one of them has a very long list of things that are conditions to the permit that must be met at the beginning and throughout the term of the permit in order for the uh, permittee to be able to continue operation. Again, just a couple of examples. It would be important to Linux to get an indemnity from this uh, wireless provider. The wireless provider should be required to indemnify the town so that if something happens and if somehow somebody sues the town on some legal theory, that they will be indemnified by the wireless provider and your taxpayer won't be on the hook for anything that happens. This is very important, especially in small towns. You know, people who sue, and you know, I know a few plaintiffs lawyers, okay? What do they do? They look for deep pockets. And they look for as many deep pockets as they can find. Who better to sue than the local jurisdiction, a tax-supported entity? You need to be indemnified or else you're going to leave yourself exposed to potential liability. Second, insurance. There's nothing in here about insurance. We don't know what kind of insurance the, the uh, uh, permittee will be required to have. Most uh, ordinances require at least commercial general liability. We have been advocating in the past that in addition, since most commercial general uh, liability policies have a pollution exclusion, and oh, by the way, RF is pollution under the insurance laws, uh, that they also have pollution coverage by way of an addendum. And it is possible to get this um, then if somebody is harmed and if they successfully sue uh, the wireless provider, we know that there will be insurance to cover that. That will also have the salutary effect of, again, protecting the local municipality. You know, these, these wireless providers, they play a lot of corporate shell games and they will put things in one corporate shell that may not have a lot of assets. And so if they get sued, they don't have assets that can be attached. It's really important to ensure that they have adequate insurance coverage or else anybody who sues and wins may not ever recover. It. Those are just two examples. I could give you a hundred more by a time. The sorts of conditions that are required for any permit. This draft ordinance doesn't mention them. 
There's one thing that I thought was interesting. We are told that this draft ordinance is necessary because we've got to bring ourselves up to speed with FCC requirements. Things have changed. We have to bring ourselves up to speed. So when I read the definitions in the ordinance, I thought, okay, they're going to match the FCC definition. Well, they don't. Let me give you two examples. The definition of tower does not match FCC rule 16100B9. It's missing an important limiting qualifier. The definition of antenna is different than the FCC rule 16002B and 1320D. Now, I don't know why they're using different definitions, but if we're trying to be consistent with the FCC, definitions is a pretty good place to start. So, you know, I think there's still a lot of work that needs to be done on this ordinance. Um, I'd almost call it amateurish. I'm sorry for the effort that's been dedicated to so long. This is what happens when you use a wireless consultant to draft your ordinance rather than looking to people who actually practice this and have done many more ordinances and look at things from just the wireless industry point of view. Now let's talk about what towns can do. First of all, your hands are not tied. You got nine fingers left. Okay, you do. <laughs> all right. I, I keep hearing that, no, you can't have a presumptive ban. No, we can't have a huge setback. No, you can't consider health issues. <clears throat> Actually, no, no, that's really true. First of all, it is perfectly permissible under the FCC rules for there to be a presumptive ban on placement in residential areas, especially towers, because they have a significant aesthetic impact. And aesthetics is the place where municipalities have the most power and control. The Ninth Circuit took away what the FCC had tried to do on aesthetics. So this is an area where the cities really and towns really do have a lot of authority. You could have for almost any reason, a presumptive ban on placement in residential areas. You could have a presumptive ban on other sensitive locations like schools or parks, any other thing that your residents think is appropriate. Now there is a caveat, granted, the act says that the town cannot act in a way that constitutes an effective prohibition. And so if the wireless provider can demonstrate that denial of the permit in any given location would constitute an effective prohibition. In other words, they really need it and it has to be right there. There's no alternative then yeah, they probably are still entitled to their permit. So the other thing that needs to be in this ordinance is a waiver process. You can rule out a lot of things and then say, if you don't like this, if you think it presents a problem, you think it's an effective prohibition, apply for a waiver and show through clear and convincing evidence that denial would constitute an effective prohibition or would be discriminatory. I've already said that these the towns have a wide range of aesthetic op options. It, it's just wide open. You know, frankly, I'm, I'm not a big fan of camouflaging these things. I'm of the opinion they ought to have a big clown nose on them. But um, nonetheless, the town should be able to decide and can decide how it wants any of these to look. If they want faux trees, okay. If they want Water towers, fake water towers, okay. If they want, you know, it to look like a Christmas pole, okay, they can do that. There are some fallout from that decision, however. One of them is when it comes to monopine faux trees. We're getting emerging evidence that these monopines, and by the way, they're one of the options in this draft ordinance, are shedding microplastics, which contain lead and other things that are toxic to people and especially children. And they get into the waterways and they affect the life in the water too. It's a growing problem. It's a big problem. And by the way, this is the kind of environmental effect that is wide open to local jurisdiction because it has nothing to do with the RF emissions. 
So I would urge that your town and your residents be very careful when they say, we want these things to look like the pine trees that are around us, because they're not like the pine trees that are around you. They're not good for the environment. Another environmental effect that a town can consider is the climate change impacts of all these wireless facilities. Um, this isn't a legal term, okay? They're energy hogs. They are very highly inefficient. They use 10 times the amount of energy that fiber to the home does. Now, granted, they're getting better, okay? They're coming up with ways to minimize that. But at present, that's about what it's like. And so you should consider whether you really want to be putting a bunch of these facilities out here that are going to consume a lot of energy that contributes to climate change. I mean, I understand you all got a little bit of energy problem up there where you are anyway. I don't know if you want a whole bunch more energy demands on your system. <clears throat> There's another climate impact. Um, towers in particular typically have generators, typically diesel generators. Those emit a bit of soot into the atmosphere and contribute to climate change. That's another thing that should be considered when it comes to whether you really want a tower with a generator in your town. And if you do want it where it should be. Um, again, this is another thing that's wide open for a local jurisdiction to look at and potentially even deny. If you think that the environmental impact, not only emission side, but just because of where the tower is, how it's made and how it will operate. If you think that that would have a negative environmental impact. Now let's get to the elephant in the room. Can these local jurisdictions even pretend to hear people when they talk about health? Yes, they can. First of all, that provision in the Communications Act is not a gag order. It does not operate to tell everybody that the residents themselves can't tell the town council what's bothering them. If they have concerns about health effects, they have every right to get up there and say that. Second, the statute says regulate on the basis of. That means active regulation, things that you prescribe or prohibit. If you are prescribing something based on the environmental effects of the emissions, or if you are prohibiting something based on the environmental effect of the RF emissions, maybe a problem. But you dang sure at the local level can consider. You can think about it. And I would contend you are remiss if you don't because there are a host of environmental, human, and other kinds of health concerns. It affects birds, bees, trees, people, and especially children. And I suggest that everybody who has a concern about this needs to stand up and tell their local elected representatives, by God, this is a, a concern to me. And those who are voting, I understand this is something that must be voted at the local level. Those who are voting, you don't have to disclose why you're voting. No. They don't ask you why you're saying I don't like this ordinance. You're just voting yay or nay. So I would, I would urge all the residents who are concerned about these things to very seriously consider whether they're going to accept propaganda that is being spread about how much the hands are tied how little you can do, and how we've just got to swallow this toad because the FCC told us we had to. I came at this from the other side. I'll disclose that. I used to represent wireless company. I represented telecommunications company, mostly the small guys, AT&T and Verizon and T-Mobile. They always hated me. They just hate me more now. But um, you know, I was in the industry and I used to teach engineers about telecom regulation. And I came into this two and a half years ago thinking, what's, what's the problem? What's the problem here? It's, it, it, there's a thermal standard. Because I thought like an engineer. Engineers understand, you know, they're great at building and maintaining objects and electrical and mechanical systems but they don't understand how humans and other living things and systems operate. It really takes an open mind 
um, for someone to sit down and think about and accept the proposition that RF can indeed affect someone at the biological level and generate a response, which may manifest in the short term or it may manifest over the long term. This is why it is so important. And yeah, we're going to take the fight to the FCC and we're going to try to convince them to change their standards. But until it does, people do need to understand the FCC guidelines simply do not adequately consider the biological effect of these rules. They do not take into account how somebody, how the population in general will respond to it. And it certainly does not take into account how some individuals, and there are more and more of them, the 30% of the people are now beginning to show effects from exposure to RF, some 3% of them violently so, to the point they're disabled. Getting big numbers, we're talking millions of people who are getting sick from this stuff. And, and our policy leaders, our elected representatives, they're going to have to take account of this. There is an explanation. The scientists understand more and more every day what it is, but they are those who are not bought by the industry. They are increasingly convinced that this is a major health problem that's going to really impact our society tomorrow, next week, and next year, and especially our children who have been exposed to this stuff since the day they were conceived. Thank you. I hope that was helpful. Thank you so much, Attorney McCullough. Um, I understand you have another appointment, uh, so I understand we have other presenters to get to, but I just want to ask, we have a whole list of questions that have come in over the last couple of days. And I want, while you're here, I want to just throw a couple at you. Uh, one of them is, what can people do if they get sick from a tower or antenna? What rights do residents have at the moment in that situation? Well, the other side will tell you, your only right is curl up and die. I'm sorry to tell you, that's their position. I got a license. I get to do this. You have no remedy. Now, I disagree. Um, there are cases in the system. There are many legal theories upon which, um, you know, we think relief will ultimately be granted. Uh, we've got a case going not too far from y'all in Lenox uh, in, involving Pittsfield, where Pittsfield Board of Health tried to do the right thing, but then they got out overruled by um, some of their political leaders. And uh, sadly, they were a little too intimidated by Verizon. Um, but, you know, we're, we're litigating that. And we're hopeful that at some point the court will understand what really happened and maybe grant the relief that we're requesting, which is to send it back to the board and tell them that they have authority to do what health boards have the authority to do under Massachusetts state law. Um, there are other legal theories. One, if you have been so negatively affected that you're suffering an impairment of major life functions, then you qualify under the disabilities laws. There are several of them. Um, context matters. ADA Title I applies in the employment context. ADA Title II applies in the public grounds, public buildings, public um, context, like in a building. If you are electrosensitive, you at least technically have a right to an accommodation so you could go in and vote or appear in court or go file something in the deed records. Um, and, you know, frankly, I think that means they need to turn the Wi-Fi off. That's what I think. If it, if it, it's an access barrier. It's exactly what it is. And indeed, the access board almost 20 years ago said that very thing. The access board, by the way, is the federal body that helps the U.S. Department of Justice design buildings um, so that they are accessible to the impaired. In large part, it's about wheelchairs. But the access board long ago said, you know, EMF can be a disability and we're going to work on some standards for it. Somehow it stopped. I don't know why. Uh, there's Title Three of the ADA, which applies to public accommodations. I take the position 
that Verizon and AT&T and T-Mobile fall within that definition. And if they've got a tower out somebody's house um, and you are sickened by it, then you have the right to seek an accommodation from them under Title III, completely separate from, you know, going to the FCC, going to your local zoning board or anything else. You could proceed directly against it. Tough to do. You're going to end up needing a lawyer, but I think that's a path. There's the Fair Housing Act. It too has disability provisions. And within it, um, if I contend, my reading of it is that if there is something like a tower on your street, um, once again, you could go directly against the wireless provider uh, based on the theory that their thing is making you sick, chasing you out of your home, and that's a constructive eviction which is something that's prohibited by the Fair Housing Act. Finally, there's a Rehabilitation Act. That's a federal statute that basically says anybody who gets federal money, and these days that's just about everybody. Uh, certainly the wireless companies get a bunch of federal money. Uh, they cannot uh, discriminate against people with disabilities. And, and so since they're getting this federal money, there is a route they could be used to seek relief under the Rehabilitation Act. Each of these types have different paths. You have to go to a different place to invoke your rights. The, the process is different. The specifics are, they vary somewhat, although the general concepts are the same. In some, you can go to state court. In others, you have to go to federal court. In some, you got to go to an agency first. And others you don't. But these are all potential routes. Uh, then, of course, you know, there's always trying to seek relief from your local zoning board. If somebody's, if you already have an illness, somebody's proposing to put one of these up. I mean, you can oppose it on the merits and you can tell them what the impact will be to you if this goes up. Now, do they have to grant you relief on that basis? Maybe, maybe not. But it is certainly something that you can tell them about, and it is certainly a basis for you to oppose uh, an application for a project. By the way, the draft ordinance does require compliance with the ADA. Great. I'll throw one more at you before we let you go. Um, Sorry, well, all my so answers are going to be long. <laughs> <laughs> That's OK. You know, this is being recorded, so people don't have to be scrambling around taking notes. They can go back through and uh, potentially save a lot of money on uh, hiring a lawyer. So uh, last question for you is, other local towns like Great Barrington and Stockbridge have setbacks from residential areas, schools, and playing fields. It's been said that Lennox can't have these or we would get sued. Are setbacks of 518 500, 800, 1,650 feet illegal or considered an effective prohibition? In other words, could Lennox implement a larger than 250 foot cell tower setback? And um, I'll just throw in here um, that Shelburne, the town uh, next door to me, actually has updated their bylaws twice in the last few years. And the most recent one, uh, they chose 1,500 feet as the setback uh, and it went right through. I mean, it, you know, there was some discussion at town meeting, of course, uh, about the whole update, but uh, that's the law of the land now in Shelburne. And they also, you know, just getting to your point about effective prohibition and and saying that we we actually don't want cell towers in this particular residential area. If anyone has been to Shelburne Falls, uh, it's sort of a little touristy, artsy uh, village here. Um, you know, they, the planning board has decided that there will be no um, cell towers in the residential area. Um, of Shelburne Falls, and they're they're mainly located up on in a cell tower park. But that's all to say, Scott, your short answer on on setbacks. Well, the short answer is, have they been sued yet? <laughs> okay. Well, look, let me tell you something about Verizon and AT and T. You know, they get up in the morning, they put on their shoes, and they sue somebody. And if they don't sue them, they threaten to sue them. They throw that around like crazy. Um, will they sue? They might. But, you know, these towns got to start considering um, maybe they're going to get sued by their own residents. You know, if, if you want, if you if your whole purpose is to avoid a lawsuit, then. 
I, I think you've got to caught the middle because at some point your own residents are going to get angry and they're going to sue you. And then while that suit is pending, they're going to unelect you. So, you know, I, I, I got to tell you, I, I'm used to being in litigation with these folks. Lawsuit doesn't bother me. I understand it's a concern. Yes, it costs money. But a couple of things are really important. One, the only cost that you're going to have is your own attorneys. They cannot get damages. They cannot shift attorney's fees. So the cost here will be your own attorneys. And so, you know, in my view, I think these local authorities just need to try to figure out what the right thing is for their residents and quit worrying about these threats of lawsuit. Sometimes they sue, sometimes they don't, but they dang sure use the threat a lot. So that's the answer to that. Thank you. Thanks so much for being on tonight and for uh, supporting the whole Pittsfield work. Uh, really appreciate that. Well, I so, hope Linux doesn't end up in the same place. Yeah, we can hope. So moving on to our next speaker of the evening, Dr. Kent Chamberlain. And Dr. Chamberlain received his PhD from Ohio University, specializing in computational electromagnetics. His research has been devoted to modeling radio wave propagation, including interfering radi radiation from computing devices and wave phenomena in the human body. Dr. Chamberlain is the past chair and professor emeritus in the Department of Electrical and Computer Engineering, and he's currently a founder in a high-tech startup company. In his more than 35 years in academia, he's performed research for more than 25 sponsors, including the National Science Foundation. He's received two Fulbright Awards, including the prestigious Fulbright Distinguished Chair, uh, which he served in Aveiro, Portugal. He's also served as an associate editor for the Institute of Electrical and Electronics Engineers, and he continues to be active in performing research and publishing. In August of 2021, the Lenox Tritown Health Department brought in Dr. Chamberlain to give an informational presentation on the health effects of wireless radiation that's available on the Lenox Tritown Health Department webpage. Dr. Chamberlain has offered his expertise to help Lenox site towers more safely to assist with the telecommunications needs of the town and to assist with the telecommunications needs of the town. And to our knowledge, uh, Lenox has not taken him up on his offer. He's here tonight to share information and answer your questions. Thank you so much for being here, Dr. Chamberlain. And uh, Courtney, I think this is the moment where we make Dr. Chamberlain the host so that he can share his slides. Great, thank you. I'll share them in just a moment. But I'm gonna change my presentation a little bit for two reasons. One is that Scott already covered some very important points. And also well, I can see that the time's running out a little bit. We're running later than we thought. So let me do my best to, to cover the material. I'll try not to rush through it too quickly. There are some really important parts that I think people should hear. Uh, first of all, I'm, uh, I'm, first, I, I'm very much into technology, as you could hear from the introduction. And so I'm not here to get rid of technology. This isn't a gloom and doom presentation. Yeah, there are some clearly identified problems, health problems associated with exposure to fields, but we know how to fix them. We can fix them. When engineers were told to build these systems, they were never told to minimize radiation. The assumption at that point was that radiation was completely harmless. It's not, and I want to say a little bit about that because I want to let you know why you might want to fight the rollout of, of installations in your city because, because of that harm. So let me kind of go to what I need to go to to get that point across. Um, Oh, also, I should let you know that I'm not here presenting my own opinions or findings. I'm here to share with you the results of a commission, a state commission, and I'll say more about that commission and, and how it was formed and why it's important. So at this point, I'm going to share my slides, hoping that I can do that. And at this point, I'm hopeful that you can see my slides. Oops, I'm not hearing anything. Jonathan, can you see them? I can see him. Fantastic. Thanks. And you need that. I shouldn't need feedback uh, after this. So as you can see on the slide, the commission I served on was coming in. I got to learn that uh, through bipartisan legislation. And it was created to answer questions about the effects of wireless radiation exposure 
which includes all generations of cell phones and cell towers. So the reason for this is that legislators were being told by the telecommunications lobbyists that such radiation exposure was completely harmless, while some of their constituents were reporting exposure was harming them. There's also scientific evidence showing harm, so legislators decided the best way to find out what the truth was was to form an independent and unbiased commission. The legislation that formed the commission, which is House Bill 522, it's it's linked in the slide, which passes passed both houses of the legislature and was signed by the Republican governor, uh, which uh, and it was clear in describing the questions that the commission was supposed to answer and the expertise needed to answer them. So I should note that I'm including hyperlinks in my slides and that I will be making them available to you. Oops, I got to admit people <laughs> now that I'm the, the host. Uh, and so if you when once you get these slides, you can simply click on them and you'll it'll bring you to the reference that I'm making in that slide, including the legislation. Um, as you can see, we ended up with uh, people with the expertise you would expect to be able to answer the questions that we were being asked. In other words, what's really going on with health and with, with exposure to electromagnetic fields? So we got brought in experts, and you can see who those experts were. And we had a couple of physicians, we had a physicist, toxicology, electromagnetics, epidemiology, et cetera. And I was uh, asked to serve on the committee because of my background in radio frequency and biomedical engineering. The key point is that none of us were paid for our participation and none were affiliated with the telecommunications industry except those members who were brought in to represent that industry. After all, we needed to have their input in order to make a fair and unbiased uh, decision. Um, so uh, just to, I want to go through a little bit of the process here. I don't want to dwell on it, but I do want to let you know what the the uh, commission went through in order to come up with the conclusions that I'm going to tell you about. And I kind of told you that already. And Scott already said what some of those decisions or those conclusions were. So we did a, a scientific review of the, the publications. Uh, I was very much involved in that, in reading that. And frankly, I got to say that when we started this study, we started, when I was asked to join the commission, I didn't think there was any harm from low level wireless radiation. I was told maybe you shouldn't have your phone right next to your head. But besides that, the conventional wisdom in our discipline was that this low level radiation was pretty much harmless. So that was the long held conventional wisdom. Uh, didn't take very long, though, uh, in uh, studying and going through the literature to find many articles documenting even low-level exposure can be harmful, particularly long-term exposure. So one claim, I mean, I'm assuming that uh, you have heard from people from the telecommunications industry, you've heard from people who are promoting the rollout of wireless facilities in your town. So one claim you may have heard from those people is that the only articles showing harm from wireless radiation exposure are those from what they call fringe journals. Now, I'm familiar with low quality journals, which is what I assume they mean by fringe, as a former associate editor for a major scientific journal and as the former chair of a high-tech academic department, I'm familiar with ways to determine the quality of a journal. And I can go into some of the detail about how I can determine that quality, but the bottom line is I can assure you that the information the commission used was from high-quality publications, and that's that's what we used. We did a lot of looking in the peer-reviewed science. We looked at the quality of the journals, and if they didn't meet our standards, we didn't use them, but we did draw our conclusions from looking at lots and lots of high-quality peer-reviewed journals. Another claim made by the telecommunications industry is that journal papers showing harm from wireless radiation are what they call cherry-picked. The suggestion is that most studies do not show harm and the, that only the few that do are presented as evidence of harm. Unfortunately, this erroneous claim can be easily refuted by analyzing uh, the findings of papers from credible journals to determine whether they do or do not show harm. Uh, one such analysis was performed by Dr. Henry Lai at the University of Washington, and that analysis shows that over 90% of the public, uh, papers, over 90%, show oxidative stress as a result of wireless radiation exposure. 
So I would like to summarize the last two bullets on this slide. And the first is that there are many publications in high quality journals that show harm from wireless radiation exposure. The second is that such publications are not in the minority. They are in the majority. Uh, given this, if anyone, like the representatives from the telecom industry, if anyone tells you that low-level wireless radiation is harmless, they are either woefully misinformed or, putting it politely, they are not being truthful. So I do want to say a little bit more, moving along and uh, talking about the uh, major uh, harm-causing effects of wireless radiation, and that is oxidative stress. So I'll say a few words about it. That stress can lead to the creation of free radicals, and I'm assuming most of you have heard about free radicals. Studies show that cell mitochondria are affected by even low-level radiation exposure, and that causes free radicals to form during the production of ATP. Don't mean to get too nerdy on you, but I wanted to show that there is a known mechanism for causing problems. Um, uh, the, you may know that free radicals lead to chronic illnesses, such as the one shown on the slide, such as Alzheimer's disease and diabetes. And you know that these, these illnesses have increased significantly since the rollout of wireless communications in the United States. Now, I'll be saying more about that later, but I've put in hyperlinks to the diseases so you can look at some of the peer-reviewed articles and the ones that describe the association between those diseases and wireless radiation exposure. There are thousands of articles, and we looked at hundreds of them in the commission, but I'm only able to link, do a little bit of linking on the slide here. Um, just returning to the activities of the commission, uh, we did write our final report, uh, and uh, in it was in November two years ago, November of 2020, and you can read it. It's linked right here, and so uh, you don't have to read the entire um, report. It's uh, 390 pages, but you really can get a gist of, of what we were saying, what our conclusions were by reading the first 17 pages. It's also worth noting, since I'm talking about the, the process from the commission, that nine of the experts, we brought in uh, not experts uh, to, to talk to us, to provide us with insights, to share their knowledge about uh, wireless radiation. And only one of them claimed, only one of the nine uh, experts that we were brought in claimed that wireless radiation is harmless. And that was the one expert brought in by the telecommunications industry. And that expert was the only one who was paid to present. All of the other experts, the ones who weren't paid, reported that there is harm from wireless radiation. And, and here's something else I think you know you need to know. It's very important, and that is uh, about the FCC exposure limits that you're that are being used right now, uh, and in fact, we're being exposed to them right now. So it became clear to the commission early on that the FCC exposure limits currently in place are completely inadequate to protect people and the environment. It's not only people that get affected, it's the environment as well. So we decided how those limits had been established. We found that those limits were set in the 1980s and were based on short term, around an hour, behavioral studies on rats and monkeys. You see, the assumption with these limits is that if a radiated signal is not strong enough to warm tissues, it will not cause harm. Now, an example of waves warming your tissues is the microwave oven, and clearly that amount of heating can cause harm in the short term, the short term. So going back to the study, the animals in the study had been trained to push a lever to receive food, and they were food deprived at the onset of the study. They were then exposed to increasing levels of radiation until they could no longer perform the task of pushing the lever. That radiation level was designated as the upper exposure limit. And then a safety factor of 50, they divided that upper limit by 50, and that was applied to come up with a, a guidelines for the general public, and that's the limit that's being used today. The, the, the limits that the FCC used came from an hour-long study on rats and monkeys, and it just exposed them to the point where they couldn't perform a simple task. So obviously, a study conducted an hour cannot assess the long-term exposure, exposures, such as what we're like exposed to 24-7. I mean, it's like having a group of people smoke a pack of cigarettes each and then proclaiming that cigarettes are safe if they all survive, which they probably would. So clearly, these radiation limits are ridiculously outdated. So we tried to repeatedly to get the FCC to come and, and talk with us. 
uh, but they wouldn't, and they never showed up anybody and uh, sent anybody. We also asked the other lettered agencies, such as the FDA and the EPA, but they never came either. Now, a reason that some government agencies are not responsive to the public uh, can be explained by the fact that they are captured by the industries they're supposed to regulate. Uh, the case of the FCC being captured is explained in the Harvard University report linked here, uh, and it's, uh, it's, it makes for good reading. It provides an explanation as to why wireless limits have not changed in more than 26 years, even though they've been successfully ca challenged in court. And you'll hear more about this from Theodora Scorato, who will be speaking next. Uh, the reason that industry wants to keep these high limits, as you can guess, is money. It would cost a lot of money to do things correctly to do them the way they're doing it. And I could go into great detail about that. To do it the way they're doing it is relatively inexpensive. To do it right costs a lot of money. So, again, trying to go a little bit quickly here. Uh, if you're not familiar with what some of the immediate effects of wireless radiation can look like, I offer the following. And uh, this particular example comes to us from California, although there are a large number of other examples that I could have used, including your neighbors in Pittsfield. In the California case, the towers were placed on or near fire stations, which makes sense logistically because of coverage area, easy access, availability of utilities, etc. And if the radiation from these facilities was not injurious to health, this placement would be ideal from an engineering perspective, but as I've mentioned in the past few slides, radiation does negatively impact health, and the firefighters were con exposed continuously during the time in the station. I should note that the maximum power output from the towers measured inside the, the fire station was only 5% of the FCC guidelines, but as I just mentioned, the, those guidelines are really kind of meaningless in terms of being protective. I'm using the firefighter case as an example because we generally think of firefighters as being robust physically and as being the last ones to complain. So when firefighters do complain, we should take them seriously. So what happened after the cell towers were turned on? I'll read directly from the slide. Within a week of installation, many firefighters developed unusual symptoms of headaches, fatigue, insomnia, memory loss, confusion, nausea, and weakness. After a time, firefighters in stations with adjacent cell towers were found to have forgotten CPR or became lost responding to a fire they, in a city they grew up in. So for those of you who are familiar with what's going on in Pittsfield, you'll recognize these symptoms as being the same ones reported by the people living near the Verizon Tower. So what's being reported to you here is not an anomaly. It's not psychosomatic. I've heard industry representatives claim that it's all in their heads regarding people reporting such symptoms, but that claim is readily, readily refuted by science, as is shown on the next slide. And obviously, I don't have time to go into detail about this, but what this slide references is one scientific study. There have been many on neuropsychiatric effects due to radiation exposure. In this case, people were, you know, a sham exposed or not exposed or exposed and their, their symptoms were monitored. So there's no way that they could be faking it. So this is, it rules out the claim that it's all in their head. And so what's also significant is the symptoms identified in the scientific studies, which you can read right here, are, they'll match the, 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 those symptoms of firefighters and the people in Pittsfield, or a lot of people who are exposed. Um, so, oh, and just a point to make, which I get with this slide sometimes, clearly there are a number of causes for the symptoms listed in the article. For example, you can get insomnia if you're drinking too much coffee, and you can get headaches from drinking too much wine. Uh, but many of these symptoms uh, are, are as a result of wireless radiation. And even if we don't experience these particular symptoms due to exposure, we still experience oxidation when we are exposed. That's the premature aging, that's the diseases that can result from oxidative stress. So I'd like to quickly now go on to what we're trying to do here in, in New Hampshire. And uh, many new municipalities, and this is what Scott was saying, have enacted meaningful protective ordinances. What we're trying to do is enact ordinances here at the state level. And our original legislation included that 500 meter setback. Also, I got called for a registry so you can, people could report radiation sickness. 
Uh, neither of those were lasted in, you know, is going through the legislative process because the committee that looked at our legislation said that this is not going to make it through the full legislature. We have to pare back. But still, we agree with you guys, there is a problem. And they voted 15 to 3 in favor of, of us writing legislation that would be protective and would still pass the legislature. Uh, if you want to know more about some of this, I uh, have uh, a, a listing of uh, 38 epidemiological studies that show what happens to people who live near cell towers. And the vast majority of those studies show for adverse health effect, effects. You don't want to live near a cell tower. And the second link, which I'd recommend, uh, describes the rationale used by the New Hampshire Commission to come up with that 500 meter setback. We did it a couple of different ways, but we came up with a strong rationale for why you should set back new towers. Now, before I conclude, I'd like to share two slides with you. My intention is to bring the findings of the New Hampshire Commission a little bit closer to home. Specifically, if you're thinking that the negative effects of wireless radiation only happen to other people and in other communities, I'd like you to consider the following. As you can see, this is uh, the uh, Alzheimer's disease rate in this country. And for the and over the last 20 years, it has more than doubled. And I, I just uh, did search. You can do the same thing, do a search for internet for Alzheimer's rate, and this is what you'll come up with. It just popped up. So I'm not saying, I can't say that wireless radiation exposure caused this increase, but I can say that peer-reviewed scientific studies show a mechanism linking wireless exposure and Alzheimer's. However, oh, without those studies, the plot in front of you begs the question about what has caused this dramatic increase. What has changed? What changes have happened since 2000 that could explain the data on this chart? A little pause there. Next, let's consider the Alzheimer's rate, I mean, the, uh, the diabetes rate, which we, you know is increasing. So the color coding on this map, which is for 2004, shows the diabetes rate in our country starting with 2004. The light blue scene in most of the country indicates a diabetes rate of between 3.3 and 6.5%. You can read that from the, the caption there, the color coding for the map. And in other parts of the country, some of, some of the urban areas, you do have a higher rate of uh, uh, diabetes. So let's move forward. We just move forward a couple of years. Moving forward to 2012, we see a marked increase in the diabetes rate for pretty much the entire country. Clearly, something significant is going on uh, to change the for this larger change uh, to happen. And it probably isn't simply diet or computer games. One event that did occur between 2004 and 2012 is the introduction of the iPhone, along with the rapid rollout of Wi-Fi in schools. As noted earlier, science has shown an association between wireless radiation exposure and diabetes, just as it has for, uh, for exposure and Alzheimer's disease. And finally, we can see that in the, the increase continues into 2019. So while I can't uh, definitively claim that wireless radiation exposure is the cause of the disease increases shown on this and previous slides, I think you'll agree that even without reading volumes of scientific journals, we should exercise caution as we consider more radiation sources to our environment. So in conclusion, a formal state commission of unbiased experts formed through a bipartisan legislation concluded that low level wireless radiation, such as what you get from your cell phone and cell towers is harmful to human health and the environment. And technological development should be pursued to lessen exposure levels. As I mentioned at the beginning of our presentation, there's a, a lot that can be done to significantly reduce exposures without preventing you from being disconnected. We can do it. And uh, migration to fiber connections and wired connections will result in much, much faster, more secure, and more environmentally friendly approaches to network networking. And as you finalize your ordinances, I strongly encourage you to act on the findings of the New Hampshire Commission. There should be no hurry in deploying new wireless facilities as there are other very superior alternatives to wireless broadband. And that concludes my presentation. I look forward to entertaining questions when we have the Q&A session. Thank you so much, Dr. Chamberlain. Um, for I've seen you do a few of these now, and and I, 
I appreciate how you're able to get so much um, into a relatively short period of time. I know you could go on quite a bit longer. <laughs> um, so now it's my pleasure to introduce Theodora Scarato. Theodora Scarato, MSW, is the Executive Director of Environmental Health Trust, a scientific think tank that publishes research and educates policymakers on environmental health issues. EHT scientists are among the leading independent voices calling for reducing wireless worldwide. And last year, they had a favorable win in the organization's joint lawsuit against the FCC regarding the FCC's 1996 human exposure limits for cell phone and cell tower radiation. Theodore directs EHT educational programs, publishes research, and coordinates scientific conferences and programs in the U.S. and internationally alongside EHT's senior science advisors. Scarato has co-authored several articles on electromagnetic field policy and is a lead policy analyst for the EHT database on international actions, the most comprehensive collection of information on policy actions on cell phones and wireless. I'll just throw in as an aside, as someone who's worked on this issue for uh, a number of years now, I, I and many other people who are working in this arena just repeatedly go to EHT's website as the place to find clearly presented information with graphics that people can understand. It's a huge, huge resource worldwide. I encourage you to check out ehtrust.org. Uh, she has presented at several U.S. and international conferences on environmental health, including the two EMF medical conferences, which if you don't know what those are, um, medical professionals can now get continuing medical education credit um, by checking out these medical conferences um, and you know, following their curriculum. And she's also um, presented at the Health in Buildings Roundtable Conference held at the National Institutes of Health. So it's with particular pleasure that I welcome Theodora Scarato. Thank you so much, Jonathan. And I'm just thrilled to be here. And, and thank you to um, Kent and Scott as well. So let me share my screen. So thank you so much. Um, I'm going to talk uh, and I'm going to fast forward with and, and do a little show and tell as well with pictures, um, just so you can see what things look like. Um, I'm going to talk about the regulatory situation with cell tower radiation, because uh, we're often told, and I certainly would be the first one to tell you that I fully believed that the government had our back when it come, came to uh, cell tower networks, because how could it, you know, <laughs> how could it be put up if it weren't safe? But what I've come to find out now over a decade of working on this issue um, at the policy level is that we really have a situation. It is a, a largely unregulated in terms of the health and safety issues. So, this is just to give you a background, you know, it's invisible, we can't see the radio frequency radiation, but it's coming out of the antennas and every antenna is different depending on its power and, uh, you know, where it's located uh, and what kind of uh, modulation, if it's 4G or 5G and what band and so forth. But you can see there's main beams, there's side beams, there's, there's uh, actually, if you go to uh, the permit for any one antenna, like if you live in a, um, like this family, for example, you can, uh, if they give it to you, get the permit and they will sometimes have these compliance tests, which um, will show you the compliance with FCC limits. And they'll also show the way the uh, radiation pattern is off the antenna. So this is why I'm involved because of children, uh, as was stated Earlier, children are more vulnerable. They have thinner skulls, so the radiation can move quicker uh, into the brain through the skull, which is thinner. They also have developing brains. Uh, and so there is quite a body of research looking at the vulnerability of children. They have more active stem cells, and stem cells have been shown to be uh, more biologically impacted with some frequencies uh, compared to other types of cells. So we know that environmental exposures when you're younger can have a really larger impact when you're older, even very low levels. Um, but what's happening these days is no longer what I would consider low level, although it's certainly lower than a cell phone to the head at times. So here's just a mess of a situation. And we have um, 
so many examples that I'm going to be showing you. I wanted to show you this. This is actually, unfortunately, right near my my daughter's school. Um, this is a cell antenna system that's on top of the grocery store. And there's a poll. And why I'm showing you this is how the government measures what is safe and what is not. The colors you see represent um, the amount of the percentage of the FCC limit. So the FCC has a limit that they say is safe, as uh, Kent Chamberlain talked about. That limit does not protect against uh, biological effects, uh, cumulative effects. It was set based on these handful of small animal studies. Um, and so this would be, um, you know, what they would say there is a compliance zone, meaning within these areas, it exceeds FCC limits. And then as it goes out, it's a lower level. Um, but you can see how it moves. Now, one thing that um, is so important to keep in mind is that there is no uh, checking that goes on unless a community or a municipality is ensuring that there is checks, yearly measurements, uh, measurements every time there's an upgrade. In fact, the companies provide through who they hire um, those uh, quote unquote independent consultants to provide those regulatory checks. So I thought of course, the EPA, of course, uh, the National Cancer Institute and the CDC and the FDA, the Department of Labor, they have it covered. They are working on this issue and they're making sure that the people are protected. But in fact, there has been no systematic review of the totality of the evidence uh, by any or even a bunch of them put together uh, uh, federal agencies that are tasked with protecting the public health. There's been no... Uh, adequate risk assessment or um, a hazard assessment for all the health effects. That was never done. These limits were set based on uh, the assumption that heating was the only harm. There's no U.S. regulatory agency with health, environmental, or safety expertise that actually is uh, ensuring safety for cell towers, for those base station antennas that we're talking about. Now, I think we, I, I covered that in my, as I was just talking, but the limits that we have don't protect against biological effects. They were not based on an understanding of children's vulnerability. Those studies came later where they looked at uh, children's bodies and brains, and also they looked at young animals to see what the, the impact might be. And they weren't based on long-term cumulative exposure to what we're exposed to today. So. In 2019, when the FCC uh, decided not to review FCC limits, and I'll just step back a little bit. In 2013, the FCC asked the question, should we, should there be a review of FCC limits? Um, and, you know, should we launch a, a, a review? It's called an inquiry. And there were thousands of submissions about why, about the science, recommendations from scientists, from uh the public and from public health experts saying there has to be a full review of these limits, meaning engaging um, authorities to look at this issue comprehensively and look at the totality of the science. And they said that they didn't have to. So we sued uh, along with other groups and uh, um, had a favorable win in that the FCC was found to be arbitrary and capricious in setting the, I mean, in affirming their 1996 limits. Now, I talked about the regulatory gap and everyone says, or when this happens in communities, we often hear, well, the FDA has it covered. It says on their website that 5G is safe, but yet they don't have authority for cell towers. They haven't reviewed cell towers. They haven't reviewed impacts to the brain. They haven't reviewed impacts to a sperm. They haven't reviewed oxidative stress. They haven't reviewed um, genotoxic data. And when asked, a mother asked uh, the F uh, lawyer, there was actually a long chain of conversations about this issue. And finally, the FDA attorney wrote back, the FDA does not regulate cell towers or cell tower radiation. Therefore, the FDA has no studies or information on cell towers to provide in response to your questions. This is an antenna system on a uh, bay housing, a public housing of uh, 
in Michigan, where uh, I've been contacted by the person who lives here. And, um, you know, these were put up with no information, no, uh, no, no discussion with the community. Um, and it's, a uh, it's happening all over. Um, so we didn't have pre-market safety testing when wireless devices were and, and wireless networks were brought on the market. There's no post-market surveillance for health effects. Now, remember, for, for so many other environmental exposures, we have these regulatory safeguards. They are measuring, monitoring, what are the levels? What are the levels of air pollution? How about in water? What are the contaminants in water? We don't have any of that for radio frequency radiation. There used to be. And the last uh, full... The last report actually was in the 80s by the Environmental Protection Agency, 1986. Um, and they had done a series of studies that they put in that report. But those field offices doing that work, that was closed because the EPA was defunded from this issue. And there's really no oversight uh, related to radio frequency, as I talked about, no checking or monitoring. And these are basic uh, regulatory safeguards that you would have for whatever um, environmental pollutant or exposure um, that's been identified as a uh, pollutant. And the other thing that I just popped this in as, as Kent was talking is that there's so many other issues related to uh, wireless facilities, related to the uh, batteries or fire, as was discussed. And there was just a case uh, in California, AT&T settled for nearly $6 million. This is because AT&T didn't report the battery used to operate the emergency generators, their cell phone towers. And I know, obviously, in California, where the presence of hazardous materials is mandated by law, um, also in our community, the cell tower sites when there is the um, the batteries and so forth, those are considered hazmat. And so I would urge everyone listening to this to look into this. And this is a school kind of near my house. This is a, a high school where they have this, this uh, cell facility right near the high school. Now, in other countries, there are a variety of things that uh, the governments have done. So schools and homes would be considered sensitive areas. They would have uh, large, larger setbacks. Sometimes they'll even have more stringent exposure levels. And by the way, there are many countries um, that have exposure levels for what's allowable from cell tower radiation at much, much lower than the United States, Japan, and Australia. So that would be... Um, actually China, Russia, Israel, uh, Greece is lower, Switzerland, Italy, and so forth. And you can go to Environmental Health Trust to learn more about that. And many countries measure the levels of radiation in the community. They have like a real-time monitoring, 24-7 set up. In fact, I'll show you a map. Some, some countries like uh, French, France, and Switzerland, and actually some cities in Belgium, you can go to the map, you can click on the map, and zoom in and zoom out, and find out where the measurements, what they last were, you can see where the measurements are being taken, and this kind of environmental monitoring is what we need uh, in the United States, and we don't have that yet, and that's why it's really reckless to be rolling out all this infrastructure when we haven't adequately regulated the uh, emissions. The Environmental Protection Agency's last review on the issue of biological effects was in 1984. So when I contacted uh, Leanne Veal, who's the Director of Radiation Protection at the Office of Radiation and Air at the Environmental Protection Agency, and I asked her several questions. You know, when did you last study the impact of birds, bees, and trees? When did you last look at this issue? And so forth. She wrote a long email back. It's all on our website if you want to read it, but she uh, pointed us to this, the last report that they've done, and also confirmed that they don't have a funded mandate for radio frequency radiation matters. There's a lot of research, which I'm not really going to go into, but this is um, a study just to get another visual so that we can see what we're talking about that um, some international experts, um, Leonard Hardell and Tarmo um, Koppel, did looking at 
the radiation levels, the real world levels where they took meters and measured um, in communities. And this one is, um, I believe from, yes, from uh, Columbia, South Carolina. So that you can see from this is a small cell facility, so it's closer to the ground. So the National Cancer Institute that has a very long page Actually, there's been no research review to make a determination whether cell tower or radiofrequency radiation is safe or not. And they confirmed that to me uh, in an email. There's also been no evaluation of FCC limits. As they said to me, neither the literature reviews, refer referring to the webpage, nor the fact sheets make safety determinations. Because, of course, the National Cancer Institute webpage is often referred to as being somehow proof of safety. Some people go to the World Health Organization and say, look, it says that there's, there's no problem. Well, actually, if you know the background, which I'm not going to go into now of, of this um, EMF project, which is the World Health Organization EMF project, and you kind of dive into it and say, well, how do they know? How do they know that it's safe or not safe or there's been no adverse effects? Well, actually, they don't because there hasn't been any review since, in fact, if you go to the webpage about what they're doing, you see that they're conducting a health risk assessment that here it says to be published by 2022, but I just got word it would be 2023. Um, but the last time they did it, if you go to their document where they have this information, it's 1993. It's been a lot of science since then. And as Scott said, Verizon, the companies actually they actually define non-ionizing uh, radiofrequency radiation as a pollution in the insurance they provide for their phones and Crown Castle and the wireless companies in their uh, shareholder filings. They warn their shareholders of the risk, but not consumers nor neighbors. And I'll just read from Crown Castle's 10K. If uh, it's actually it says radio frequency emissions from wireless handsets or equipment on our communications infrastructure are demonstrated to cause negative health effects, potential future claims could adversely affect our operations, costs, or revenues. We currently do not maintain any significant insurance with respect to these matters. And they don't have insurance because the insurance companies won't insure them because it's rated as a high future risk and been compared to asbestos in many reports uh, that have been done by insurance authorities. So thank you. Thank you, Theodora. And we will hold on to some questions for you and for Dr. Chamberlain um, after our last presenter, Andrew Molnar and his wife Marie are residents of Ithaca, New York. They took up the battle against new cell towers in 2020 when the city was considering installing dozens of new towers throughout town. Over the course of over two years, they've helped lead Ithacans for responsible technology to ensure that their city and town telecommunication codes were intentional in allowing adequate cell coverage without adding redundant infrastructure. Andrew, uh, thank you for being willing to share some of uh, your experience with Ithaca tonight for the benefit of Lennox and everyone else who's on the call. Thank you, Jonathan. And um, thank you, Courtney, for organizing this uh, important forum. Uh, and uh, boy, thank you so much to Theodora and Ken for all your work. Um, our work, uh, we stand on the shoulders of gi giants of you all, and our success has been in part because of your work. So thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, as Jonathan mentioned, my wife, Marie, and I have been working on this issue with our town councils for about two and a half years now. Uh, and I could literally share uh, for hours about my experience. Um, uh, and how we finally got strong codes passed. Um, but instead I've organized my comments um, simply around five questions that Courtney asked me specifically to hone in on. So that will be my uh, structure for today. First question she said was, what were the elements in the Ithaca bylaws that were the most important to you and why? Well, we made at least 15 key changes to our codes. Uh, and I'll give you that, at least in my opinion, are the, the five uh, most important ones. Perhaps the most important thing is to put it is that in order for companies to put in new towers, uh, the telecoms have to prove a significant gap in service coverage 
using real world tests. Now this is key as most towns have more than adequate coverage for phone service. Uh, and so new cell towers are probably not needed. Uh, please note here that there's some confusion around phone versus data coverage. Towns only have to make sure legally that people can make phone calls. Data is not guaranteed. In other words, a justification for new cell towers cannot be that people just don't have enough fast enough data speeds. They have to prove that actual phone calls are dropped at a high rate. So second element, so that was the significant gap of coverage. The second key element of our codes, uh, I thought was having a substantial setback between houses and antennas and schools and antennas. Uh, and this has already been touched on by uh, several speakers, um, but it's important to have as high a number as possible. Um, the third key uh, code would be having random unannounced testing, uh, radiation testing paid for by the telecoms. So um, basically that at any point, the town can go out without telling the telecoms ahead of time and test for the radiation levels. Uh, fourth is a clause known as revocability, which essentially is a fancy way of saying that uh, a town can change or even revoke agreements with cell tower companies uh, if the law changes. So if um, our state or federal governments um, find a moral compass on this issue um, and change the laws, then cell towers can be um, adjusted and or removed if possible. So that's revocability. And finally, um, basically those who suffer with EMS, electromagnetic magnetic sen um, sensitivity, uh, can submit grievances to the town in accordance with the American Disabilities Act. That act actually officially recognizes EMS as a condition. So those are uh, five of the uh, many codes that we change and, and probably five of the most important that uh, I would suggest putting into your codes. Second question, uh, how long did it take to write the city codes? Well, once it took a while to uh, convince the council to get serious about this issue uh, after us being publicly, publicly ridiculed and called conspiracy theorists. Uh, but once they saw the science, um, they finally came around and uh, once they got serious, it took about a year or so to um, write and finalize codes. But I think if a town was um, ser serious and diligent, uh, especially getting the right help with lawyers like Andrew Campanelli, it can be done much in much shorter window than that, maybe three, four or five months. Uh, third question, why is it important to, to, uh, to take the time to get it right? Um, well, uh, as you heard some allusion to already, um, the laws around this are complex uh, and there really are only certain clear ways that towns can protect themselves. So it's important to do the research and talk to the right people to see which of those um, clauses can be put in that are legal, uh, uh, legal ways of defending um, your citizens' rights and your citizens' health. Uh, second, towers are often difficult to remove once they're in. So if you don't have those codes written and protect, protective measures um, in place already, uh, it will be hard to get those towers uh, taken out if they're already in. Uh, and finally, why is it important? Um, this essentially is what you've been hearing for the past half an hour. Um, this whole issue is affecting the health of billions of people. Uh, and uh, again, not to repeat, but thousands of studies show the harm from this radiation. And so we have to fight for our health and well being. Question number four um, Why do our city officials not have the right information about what they can and can't do? Again, some of this has already been alluded to, um, but essentially there's been uh, what seems like a pretty strong campaign of misinformation from the telecom industry who has spent millions to deflect concerns of safety, write false or misleading articles, uh, and basically label those of us who speak out. Uh, as, as conspiracy theorists. Um, so much information, um, uh, we can't trust the information uh, coming from the telecom industry. Um, and uh, as a note, a denim to that, as Ken mentioned, Kent mentioned earlier, uh, these telecom companies have captured the FCC, meaning the FCC has essentially been putting the needs of the telecoms above, above the health and the needs of us citizens. And finally, question number five, what are the top three things uh, I'd like to share with Lennox officials? Well, obviously much of what I've shared uh, I think is uh, important to know, 
Um, but finally, I want to really stress that the clause of the 1996 Telecom Act, which basically prohibited towns from considering health and safety, is both immoral and preposterous. In fact, I believe it's one of the worst pieces of legislation ever passed by the federal government. You have to ask yourself, why would the telecoms need to have this clause inserted if there were no fears or proof about health concerns? This prohibition of considering health effects is anathema to the explicit mission of most town codes, which is basically to protect the health and safety of their citizens. So I, I agree with the first speaker, um, everyone, everyone should speak up about their concern about cell towers and their health. Thank you. Thank you so much, Andrew. Um, and I know at some point, uh, someone in Shelburne contacted me and said, you know, people in Ithaca are working hard on their bylaw and they've, they've asked for information from Shelburne. And, and I think that kind of like cross pollination, sharing information between these sort of rural New England towns is, uh, is really a key, a key thing that should be done more. So it's 8.29. Um, we're scheduled to go to 8.30. I'm going to take the liberty of saying, you know, we can go to 8.45 and sort of have a hard stop at 8.45 just so we can answer a few of these questions uh, while we have you all on the call. Is that okay with you, Dr. Chamberlain, Theodora, and Andrew? Great. We'll start with you, Dr. Chamberlain. Um, I was wondering, or I should say someone here is wondering, um, it's a question about the appropriate distance for a cell tower from residences to ensure protection, quote unquote. And reading that question, it made me think, um, you know, that sometimes you've taken a deeper dive into, for example, the Brazil study and just kind of going a little bit, you know, briefly, but a little bit more in depth about how um, the New Hampshire Commission came up with 1640 for um, a distance. All right. I see that I can't show a slide, but I do have a slide that really gives an answer. Uh, it gives one answer. This is one of those problems. Now, I did have a, do have a link in my slides, but uh, oops, still don't have it. But um, that we looked at this from a number of different perspectives. One is we looked at what happens in the laboratory. What signal level has been identified in the laboratory as being the kind of threshold between where radiation is harmful and where it's not harmful? So we came up with the number and we then asked the question, how far do you have to be from a tickle, typical cell tower in order to achieve that lowest signal level? Turns out it's around 500 meters. And then we looked at an epidemiological study. See if I have this, can do this now. I, I will, I, I like showing data. And, uh, and then and I also like linking, oops, I think I'm there, oops. Can you see my slides now? Uh -huh. Yes, we can. The, you see, okay. So this is just a, a meta st or a study. Uh, I mentioned earlier that there was a meta study done where they looked at the, the results of 38 studies and came up with a combination in, of results so that you'd have more confidence in what they're presenting. So what you're looking at right now is just a slide that outlines one of those studies from the larger meta study. It was done in Brazil, and it was done at a time when most people didn't have cell phones. And the reason this is important is that it shows the effects of the cell towers themselves and not people's own cell phones. It was a large study. Look at this, is over 800 towers they looked at, and over, it turns out, over 7,000 cancer deaths. So what they did is they found out how they looked at the cancer deaths each year and then correlated, or death rate, I should say, and then correlated that with how far people lived from a cell tower. Here's the answer. And as you can see right here is that as you move away from the cell tower, where you live, where, where your distance you live from a cell tower gets farther and farther, longer and longer, your cancer rate, and that's what neoplasia is, by the way, your cancer rate goes down. The blue line is the cancer rate for the population in general. And so as you'd expect, as you get farther and farther from a cell tower, as you live farther and farther from a cell tower, your cancer rate becomes the same as for the population in general. So from this, you can see that at 500 meters, is it perfectly safe according to the study? No, you still have an elevated risk of cancer, but it did seem to be reasonable to the commission to use that value, 500 meters, 1,640 feet, 
as a setback. And if you watch that video that I have linked to my slides, then you'll see the, the other component to that rationale, which suggests that 500 meters is, is reasonable. Now, if somebody has a sensitivity, uh, electromagnetic sensitivity, that probably won't be a low enough value for them. They'll probably have to be farther away. But for the general population, this seemed to be reasonable. So <laughs> a long answer to the question. I, In fact, if I didn't answer it, uh, please follow up. Um, thank you. No, that definitely, <laughs> uh, that definitely helped. Um, maybe that was sort of a little bit of a macro lens, maybe diving into a little bit more of the micro lens. Um, Theodora, there's a question here about um, how does using fiber or cable help with people wanting better cell service? And so I would sort of jump off that and say, you know, so someone listening to this who, you know, maybe is new to the issue, they've got a smartphone, they've got a cordless phone, they've got a Wi-Fi router, they've got children, they've got a lot of stuff to get, do, uh, to get done in a given day. Can you just like walk us through like someone who's like, oh, you know, better cell service would be great. Um, but I do have, you know, fiber at home or I do have a cable. Can you just talk a little bit about what someone like that might consider if they do end up feeling like, well, you know, maybe better safe than sorry? Sure. So if from the from a broad overview, the more we use wired and corded connections, the data is not going in the air, it's going through the wire. Um, and also we need less, um, you don't need as much wireless base stations around if people are using corded and wired connections. So that means not only um, like right now, I'm talking on actually a wired computer. It means wired to the home and through the home. And also I got this hooked up through my uh, Verizon um, I don't even know if it's a modem or uh, the modem that's outside um, and added that on so that when I'm in my home, I actually don't use the cell phone. Now, also when my kids come or when my daughter comes back from college and wants to use her cell phone, um, I have, which, you know, they're all using their cell phones to a degree that's completely over the top. Um, I actually have a, a connector that you can connect so that she can do a lot of things on her cell phone and not have to be using the um, cell service or any actually any kind of, of wireless. Because a lot of times when you're in a space and you're, you know, you're outside or you're you're visiting somewhere, you're using that cellular. And if you have a wall or something that that taps down the signal, um, that like why why not have a a phone that works and actually one of the things that we're asking for is wired connections um in buildings it just makes sense to have more wires you won't need to be using the air to be the way that the highways of data are traveling i don't know if i went around in a lot of circles there but no no i think that gives a really a clear sense of you know outline makes it, make Go, go ahead. I just say it's faster, it's safer, and it's more secure. And it is future proof to use fiber or, or wired and corded connections rather than uh, wireless. The reason companies want everything to be wireless is quite because they want it to be convenient, although that's helpful. It's because it's really less regulated than wired connections. So they have less regulations and rules. And so it's uh, to their economic advantage to have everything be wireless. I mean, how come are there so many situations where we don't have uh, the, the wired connection we used to? Well, where'd the payphones go? There to, there's a place for a payphone. They don't have to be everywhere, but I mean, okay, I'll stop. But there, there's a reason for this, this change and it's economic. You just follow the money. Right. Thank you. Um... I'm going to circle back to you, Kent, while it's on my mind. Um, there's a question here that says, Lennox hired a consultant with an IEE certificate. Why is that not considered the best standard of knowledge out there? And you could also explain what IEE is. And I'll just throw in as an aside, um, you know, I understand that uh, Lennox has hired a consultant. And I'll just share from my point of view, working in various cell tower um, processes out here that the consultants that have been hired, because typically in the bylaw, there's like, oh, you know, the 
the uh, applicant company has to pay the, for the town to hire a consultant. And there are these consultants who, you know, appear to have, you know, they do have credentials, but they typically actually have a long history of working inside or with the industry. And so it's all, all the advice is coming from a trusted source, but it's all sort of coming from a basically kind of industry-ish perspective. They will tell you, oh, there's a gap of service here. There's not a gap of service here based on this propagation map. But uh, essentially, I'll just say that, yeah, it's been it's been tough going with the consultants um, out here. Can you want to talk to that a little bit? Yeah, sure. Do You actually gave a good part of my answer. I am a senior life member of IEEE, which is the Institute for Electrical and Electronics Engineers. They're the professional organization for people like me. And it's a good organization, but they do have a, uh, an industry bias. So is this appropriate to bring in an IEEE person to be a consultant? Well, it depends on what you're asking that consultant to do. It's a, something actually that I have done in the past. I've gone into locations and I've said, well, if you put a, an antenna here, you'll get coverage area here. And yes, this will affect it this way. This will affect it that way. And that's all fine and good. I think the problem comes in is when you look to organizations like IEEE for advice about whether or not the standards, the guidelines, the radiation exposure guidelines are adequate. They're totally unprepared to give you an answer like that. But if it's simply to put in, make an installation, that should be fine. Or if they're going to be making measurements about where they do and where they don't receive signals, that should be fine also. But just be careful that you're not asking a consultant to make judgments about something that they're totally unqualified to do, such as health effects. Thank you. Um, Andrew, I'll ask you one question and then I'll turn it over to Karen Beckwith for some closing comments. Um, you know, one of the first uh, pieces of advice I got when I started working on these issues was from a lawyer who's actually, you know, part of the Shelburne Planning Board. And he basically said to me, you know, it's important for you to understand that this is a political and not a scientific battle in the sense that there will always be people who say, well, you know, look at that science over there, you know, and then there'll be people saying that says this. So then therefore, you know, we don't know the truth. So let's just keep going with the flow kind of thing. And I, I was just wondering, Andrew, if you could share any kind of words of wisdom for folks in Linux who are watching this webinar or this meeting and thinking, well, I still feel pretty confused. It still seems pretty overwhelming. I'm not prepared to like get in there and like do the nitty gritty, you know, policy writing that Scott was alluding to. What, what would you say to people like that in terms of how they can participate and in, in the importance of their getting involved? Well, mainly make your voice heard, uh, sharing your concern uh, at meetings uh, about the health concerns and the studies that are showing harm. Um, what, one of the things I uh, routinely tell folks is, uh, I believe uh, one of the most, if not the most important thing that we did was make one-on-one -on -one calls to council members uh, and appeal to their uh, emotional, um, uh, you know, the emotional side, especially people who were suffering from some form of EMS, um, but also uh, especially in private really hammering home the science. And that includes sending you know, repeated emails with links about with Kent's videos, for example, uh, or uh, the study pages from Theodora's site, uh, but repeatedly hammering the science home about um, the, the, the concerns. Um, it's a lot. Uh, we were ridiculed publicly actually by a Cornell University engineering professor, um, but we didn't back down. And so uh, it's one of those fights that if you're going to get into it, you need to be prepared to take the heat and then to respond in kind uh, and respond to every point that's made with the science, with a clear head of facts, um, uh, like both Kent and Theodora have presented. Does that get at what you're saying? Or Yeah, better than I even hoped for. That was, that was inspiring. Thank you. Um, so now, as we near... Uh, 845. I want to turn it over to Karen Beckwith, who is a Lennox resident. And Karen's just going to offer us sort of a summary of where we are now, or where you are now, uh, with the planning board process, with this rewriting this bylaw, and share a little bit about next steps. Karen, are you on the call? I am. Can you hear me? I can. Welcome. Hi. Uh, just really wanted to thank everyone. 
who's listening in on their computers and who are sitting in town hall um, and all of our presenters tonight um, and taking the time out of your busy schedules to attend this very important and exciting meeting. We believe that Linux can be connected and protected in regards to future telecommunication service. Um, I'm a Linux resident. I've been here for 22 years now. I've lived and worked in the town of Lenox until just very recently. Now I work in Great Barrington. Um, and I'm just one of many citizens who want to ensure that the new wireless zoning bylaw will prevent the cellular industry from inappropriate, unfortunate placements of future facilities. We want a bylaw that will protect our home values. We want to buy it because when people get sick, your home becomes worthless. We want a bylaw that protects our health and the health of every soul in our town, young, middle-aged, and old. Sadly, the current draft of our bylaw does not provide protection for property values, health, or offer decent setbacks or adequate opportunity to oppose, for a citizen to oppose an installation. So, in the spirit of cooperation and collaboration, there's been a group, a small team of Lennox citizens, including my husband, Scott, who've been really paying attention and going to all the planning board meetings, either in person or, you know, logging in on the computer. Repeatedly, this group of citizens has asked the town planning board to meet with and listen to tonight's roster of experienced and truly independent experts in technology, zoning, health, and in the telecom industry itself. And this often repeated offer has been repeatedly refused. And so tonight they opened up the forum to everyone so we can learn together. We can get an improved bylaw written. We believe that. We can get a bylaw that's acceptable, that's protective, that's forward thinking, it is possible, and Lennox deserves nothing less. It's a big topic. It's complicated, and we hope everybody learned something this evening. Take your new knowledge and all your questions out into the world. Be heard. Bring your comments and your question to the next town public hearing on Tuesday, November 29th at 6. Come in person or come in Zoom. The new draft bylaw will be voted on by the whole town or everyone who we can get to attend at a special town meeting. And it is currently and tentatively scheduled for December 8th, 2022. You've got to turn up and you've got to vote and you've got to speak the truth to power. Thanks everybody. Thank you so much, Karen. And if someone's listening to this and feeling inspired to uh, connect with you or Lennox for safe uh, cell tower sighting, how would they do that? Oh, Courtney sent me a little message and it says, let people know that if they want to join the mailing list, is this what you're talking about? Exactly. If people want to join the mailing list for more information, they can email Scott, who is set up to do that. And the email address is, and I don't actually know the email address because I haven't emailed Scott because I live with him. Or maybe she's talking about our, our presenter, Scott. Um, but I think she's talking about Scott Barrow. Anyway, um, it's on the, tonight's invitation, the email address. Right. So it's look on, on the invitation address. for an email address. I think I remember seeing it on the invitation. So there's that. I think everyone who's, am I right, that this recording will be shared once it's posted, the recording will be shared with everyone who um, showed up this evening. So um, you will be hearing something more from this end. And if you want to proactively reach out um, to Karen, then use the email on the invitation. So with that, we're at 846. I want to thank everyone for taking time out of their busy lives for this super important issue. And particularly thank our presenters, Dr. Chamberlain, Theodora, Andrew, and Scott. And I'm wishing everyone a safe and pleasant evening.
Jonathan, thank you so much. This is Courtney Pilardi. I just wanted to very quickly say that the email is hello at safecell01240.com. Again, that's hello at safecell01240.com. And there's also a Facebook page for those on Facebook, which is Lennox Citizens for Safe Cell Sighting. If people have questions, we would love to answer them, whether they are in person or Zoom. We will ensure that we get a recording out. Please make sure that we have your email address and we can add you to the mailing list, send you the link and answer any um, outstanding questions that you have and make sure you come to the planning board hearing. Thank you. Thank you, Courtney. Good night, everybody.